climate change is already impacting our lives. As it gets worse, we will be affected by more floods and storms, bushfires and droughts. Globally, there will be less clean water and farmland available. Who said this? Surely it was the Greens, right? Well, if that's what you guessed, you'd be wrong. This is a quote taken directly from the website of the militant Marxist group, the Socialist Alliance. What about this one? Conversion to a more sustainable economy will bring a healthier economy as well as a healthier environment. I mean, that must have been the Greens, right? Well, you'd be wrong again. That one was directly from the Communist Party of Australia. Okay, how about this one? Inequality in Australia continues to grow, with unequal wealth distribution increasing significantly over the past decade. Students, young families and those looking for work are seeing their financial support stalling or going backwards. This pattern will only increase inequality further unless we address it now. Yep, that's right, this one was the Greens. So are the Australian Greens communists? Let's answer this question once and for all. In 1971, I helped found an environmental group in the basement of a Unitarian church in Vancouver, Canada. Fifteen years later, it had grown into an international powerhouse. We were making headlines every month. I was famous, and then I walked out the door. The mission, once noble, had become corrupted. Political agendas and fear-mongering trumped science and truth. Here's how it happened. Sadly, Greenpeace has evolved into an organisation of extremism and politically motivated agendas. Patrick Moore, founder of Greenpeace. After the true horrors of communism were revealed to the world in the 1970s, the far left were in crisis. They predicted a utopian world of equality and abundance. Instead, communism inflicted misery, death and suffering on all those dominated by it. What were the communists to do? A man of honour and reason would evaluate their ideas on their merits and change their views accordingly, but communists have no honour, and likely no souls. So instead of saying, well, that didn't work, capitalism seems a lot better, maybe we should try that instead, the communists simply changed tactics. Jordan Peterson notes the work of the first postmodernist, Jacques Derrida. I think that this, this transgressive behavior that you're describing is part of the all-out assault on Western categories of thought. And I think that that was started not even so much by the Marxists as by the French intellectuals of the late 1960s, especially Jacques Derrida, who maybe is the most dangerous person of the last 40 years. And he's, of course, the hero of the humanities and much of the social sciences. Right. And he believes that, and states this in his work, that the whole purpose of categorization is for exclusion. And so the, that... And categorization is the basis of cognition. Yeah. And so he basically has made the claim that thought itself is an agent of oppression. This man, so revered by the left, said such things as, To pretend I actually do the thing, I have therefore only pretended to pretend. And, I always dream of a pen that would be a syringe. And finally, contrary to what phenomenology which is always phenomenology of perception, has tried to make us believe, contrary to what our desires cannot fail to be tempted into believing, the thing itself always escapes. In other words, this soulless monster produced nothing but unreasoned rubbish hidden behind big words. However, it was rubbish lapped up by communists who had just had their universe ripped open by facts and evidence. As Stefan Molyneux said in his talk, the truth about untruth, postmodernism exposed. I really believe that if you actually processed the amount of harm that you've engendered in the world, the amount of destruction and, and deaths and suicides and murders and, and evisceration of human potential and, and opportunity, and, and if you really process that, you'd kill yourself. Like I, I think that when you've dedicated yourself to that demonic doctrine for long enough, and if you've defended it and extended it, right? Because if the people on the left had said, oh, wow, there's this big experiment going on in Russia. We better go find some way about it. We got to go find out if it works. They find out it's not working. They should push back against it right away. That can be an honorable and good thing to do. They could have saved decades and 100 million lives 
if they had done what their doctrine damn well suggested and gone to find the empirical evidence that associated or was associated with its implementation. They could have saved Korea. We'd have no North Korea. They could have saved China. No Chairman Mao. No, what is it, 60 million people killed or 50 million people killed under Chairman Mao. It's so weird when you can't even round it off to the nearest 10 million sometimes. They would have saved Cambodia. They would have saved Eastern Europe. Uh, they would have saved North Vietnam. They, they would have saved the Vietnam, like an enormous amount of human suffering, more than the two world wars put together. They would have saved all of that. If instead they covered it up and extended it, if you really got that, like if you had the capacity, if you had empathy, you wouldn't do that anyway. But I, th I really think that if, like it becomes life and death, they have to destroy logic and evidence, otherwise logic and evidence will literally destroy them literally destroy them, they will become so brutally depressed and suicidal they will take themselves out. Or they'll be so disgusting and vile and viewed so negatively that nobody will want to have sex with them and their genes will die out, which is an intergenerational predation that organisms do an extraordinary amount to avoid. Faced with the choice of either admitting the true horror and immorality of their own belief system or ignoring reality, the left chose the quicker, easier, and more seductive path. The left chose the dark side. Facts and evidence destroyed their worldview, so they destroyed facts and evidence. Some chose feminism and other postmodernist academic anti-intellectual endeavours, but many chose to cloud their ideas in the veil of environmentalism. The rise of the Greens perfectly matches the timeline of other far-left movements around the world. The attempted Franklin River hydroelectricity scheme engaged a movement of people passionate for preserving Australia's environment. However, while many of the Franklin protesters would go on to be leaders in the Greens, the first shoots of Australia's Green political movement spouted in the 1970s. Just a reminder, this is when the world was shown the true horrors of communism and Jacques Derrida rose to prominence. Other state-based Green parties sprung up in the early 1980s, New South Wales was the first to register the name The Greens in 1983. Western Australia, which fostered an earlier nuclear disarmament movement, had the first Green Senator in 1990. Today, the Greens not only speak for the environment, but also on behalf of people who are disadvantaged in our society. Children, refugees, students, people with disabilities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and individuals and families living in poverty. The mission of the Greens reads remarkably similar to that of any social justice warrior. In fact, they have an entire policy page dedicated to social justice that lists all the usual postmodernist victim groups we've all come to associate with the oppression Olympics. I wonder if they noticed the homeless man in the picture was a white male. I guess he lost his privilege card. A quick glance at their policies confirms what was already obvious. The Greens support massive wealth redistribution enforced by the state. Policies such as Ending poverty and reducing inequalities in income and wealth are essential to social well-being and democracy. Achieving economic and social justice depends upon democratic participation in economic decision-making. Translation we want the state to use its monopoly on force to steal people's money and use it to buy votes, in the name of democracy. Deliberate and coordinated government intervention and, where appropriate, government assistance is necessary to encourage a diverse and resilient Australian economy and create more green employment opportunities in a dynamic economy. Translation we want the state to use its monopoly on force to coerce businesses into investing in things we want them to invest in, and will pay for it with money stolen from the populace. We also don't understand economics, are betting on you not understanding economics, and like using fun-sounding words like dynamic. Public assistance is generally best provided through universal service provision or targeted payments rather than through tax concessions which often fail to assist low-income earners. Translation, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Also translated as, we want to extort from those who earn it 
and hand it to those who didn't. It's also obvious they haven't seen Stefan Molyneux's video, The Truth About Welfare. I'll link in the description, but spoiler alert, welfare is really, 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 really bad for genuinely poor people. The Communist Party and the Socialist Alliance mirror these policies. The Socialist Alliance supports universal welfare rights for all. We are opposed to the principle of mutual obligation upheld by both the Coalition and the Australian Labor Party, because this forces people into low-paid, alienating work while sabotaging existing wages and conditions for those in work. The Socialist Alliance says welfare payments for all those in need are a right. We call for a guaranteed independent income for all at a living wage, and a welfare system capable of providing to each according to their level of need from the Communist Party. Massively investing in research and development of alternative renewable energy sources under public ownership, transfer of subsidies, government support from fossil fuels and nuclear fuel sectors to energy efficiency and renewable energy and conversion programs. Notice the deliberately misleading use of the term subsidies. Anyway, substantial increase in government funding from all three levels of government for the construction of public housing, restoration of existing public housing, and purchase of additional homes from the private sector. The Greens also have a love for union-based agreements over individual agreements. See if you can guess which policy belongs to which party. Facilitating collective agreements that are union negotiated and exceed the award standards. Trade union negotiated collective industry agreements in every workplace. Compel companies to participate in funds that guarantee workers' entitlements. Have a guess. And the answers are... Those are just a few examples of the crossover between these three political movements. The only real difference between the Greens policies and those of the CPA and the Socialist Alliance are that the latter two are open and honest about their Marxist doctrine, but the Greens aren't. The Greens try to cloud their hard left Marxist ideology with a thin veneer of green environmentalism. They truly are nothing but watermelons. Greens on the outside, red all the way through. This fact is blindingly obvious to anyone paying attention. The Greens are in favour of increased taxation, a lot more government control of the economy, and are vehemently opposed to freedom of speech as I outline in my Greens vs Milo Yiannopoulos video. Communism is defined as a political and economic doctrine that aims to replace private property and a profit-based economy with public ownership and a communal control of at least the major means of production and the natural resources of a society. Communism is thus a form of socialism. In fact, it's a higher and more advanced form according to its advocates. The Greens advocate for state-sanctioned theft of private property through higher taxation and handing it to those they deem disadvantaged. They believe in the control of the economy for what they deem the communal good. Based on their policies and the definition of a communist, it is impossible to argue that this is not what they are. At most you could argue that they are socialists, but again, from Botanica, like most writers of the 19th century, Marx tended to use the terms communism and socialism interchangeably. So are the Greens communists? You're goddamn right they are. They are scum-sucking, low-down, immoral, dirtbag, disgusting, stench-ridden, cockroach acolytes of the most evil and destructive ideology in the history of humanity. The ideology that gave us Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao, over 100 million dead in less than a century, and countless more living in the worst kind of misery and suffering imaginable. Now, where did I put my helicopter? Hey everyone, so now you can see the Greens are 100% confirmed communists, uh, if we didn't already know that. 
thanks again for taking the time to watch my video. Make sure you leave a like and comment. Um, go have a look at all my other stuff. And if you enjoy that, click the subscribe, click the little bell so you get notifications as well. Uh, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you around.